Hello everyone, thanks for watching. My name is Nathaniel Kramer, also known as Preaching Musician here on YouTube. And today we're continuing the series on the road to Calvary. We're taking it from Isaiah chapter 53. Last week we talked about the fact that he was despised and rejected of men. And it talks about that all throughout verse 3, but in the middle of that verse, it interjects two phrases that I want to focus in on this video. I'll just read the verse and then we'll jump into it. It says, He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. So we talked a lot last week about his, the fact that he was despised and rejected. But we didn't talk much about the fact that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And that is something that's very important to think about, very important to look at. Obviously, it was important enough for the prophet Isaiah to put it in here. And so we need to focus on that and concentrate on that. And that's what this video is going to be about. But when we think about sorrows, and I did a little study in the Hebrew. It talks, when it talks about sorrows, it means anguish or emotional distress. And grief is referring to mal uh, malady, anxiety, calamity, and sickness. So you kind of combine all those words together, and that just gives you a little bit of an image of what Jesus went through. We know that Jesus knew what it was like to go through depression. And it's something that people like to say, all oh, Christians, they don't go through depression. But our Savior did. And He gave us an example of what to do when we go through depression. And so I'm going to be reading from Matthew uh, 26. And I'm just going to read a, a small uh, section of this chapter. It's a very long chapter. But I'm just going to start in, uh, I'm going to start in verse 36. And we'll read through this passage and try to get a little bit of an understanding of what it's like to go through depression and what we should do. What's the example that he gave for us? The Bible says in verse 36, it says, They cometh Jesus with them into a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto, his, unto the disciples, Sit ye here and I go pr uh, while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be, very, to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here, and watch with me. And he went a little farther, and fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. So, right there we see that Jesus said, he admitted to his apostles that his soul was exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. And so the first thing that I want to point out that the Bible talks about and that Jesus gave as, our, as, as an example to us is that when you're going through a moment of very, very deep depression, that's not the time to shelter in and, and just become an egg, just, just go into a shell and not talk to anybody. That's the time to reach out for support. That's the time to reach out to, for prayer. Jesus, I mean, think about it. He was, if anybody didn't need anything from anybody, Jesus didn't need anything from anyone. I mean, come on, He is God incarnate. So, I mean, obviously He didn't seek for counsel. He didn't seek for advice. And those are good things too. But Jesus, when, when all else, when He didn't really need anything else, He says, this is what I, one thing I do need from you. I need your prayers. And I hope that you have a friend that you can go to, maybe just one or two. I mean, you can see here that he had, he had, a, lot, he had a couple people with him, but he said unto most of them, stay here and pray while I go yonder. And then he took two or three people that he thought were, would, would respond to him better, that he thought that would pray for him more, and he spoke to them. So you don't, it's not like you tell all your friends. You find a few close friends that you can trust, that you know that they'll be there to support you. And you say, hey, I need your help. I need your prayers. And by the way, if you don't have anyone like that, at least be that person for someone else. Be that person that if someone's going through something really hard, something horrible, that, you can, that they can come to you and say, hey, I, I need your prayers. Now, I have a question to ask you, and, and this is something that, that I think is an issue in, in many Christian circles, in many people in Christian circles. If someone were to come to you and say, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death, what would you say to that person? Because the reason why I say that 
is because I know people, and I'm sure you know people, that if they were told that, would say, get over yourself. You know, say something insensitive like that. And I just want to say that depression, the Bible is very clear about this. Depression is real. All right? Being heavy, your soul being heavy, being exceeding sorrowful, that stuff is real. And even Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Conqueror, our Victor, even He, when He was on earth, even He went through depression. So that means, for one thing, it's not a sin to go through depression. You're not against God if you go through depression. Now, you can be against God while going through depression, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're against God. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're in sin. So if someone comes to you asking for support, please don't be insensitive to them. Don't call them to be a wicked sinner and vile person. I mean, we have the book of Job to, to look to, to understand that people can be very insensitive when, in times when you really need them. So I beg you, if you have a friend that comes to you asking for help, be a good friend. Be there for them. Support them. Try to understand what they're going through. I know that it's very hard sometimes, and I've had people come to me who were very depressed, and they're going through things that I'm thinking, oh, I have no idea what, what it must be like. I try to imagine what they're going through, but I just can't. I don't have anything to compare it to. But I always try to point them to the Savior, and obviously, I always try to pray for them. And that is something that we need to do for others and something that we need to reach out when we are depressed. So after he reached out and tried to get support for himself, tried to get prayer, have his, have his closest friends pray for him, he went a little bit further and he prayed himself. And it's a good thing to ask others to pray, but nothing substitute from your own prayers. If you are depressed, if you are sorrowful, there is one place you need to go. And that's to your Father. You need to come to Him. You need to talk it out. And here's what Jesus said. He says, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. So the first thing that He did was He said, Father, take it away, please, if it's possible. Take it away. And again, there are people who say that it's a sin to ask God to take away your problems, to ask God to take away your struggles. And it's not a sin. As, as long as it's done with the right attitude, it's not a sin to ask God to take away what He's given you. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's the right thing to do to take it away. But again, there's nothing wrong with asking that from Him. Jesus Christ Himself went to the Father and said, If it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And so that's a very important thing to understand. Don't be afraid to come to God and say, God, if it's possible, if there's any other way, could you please take this from me? But at the same time, don't leave it there. Don't turn away and don't try to twist God's arm. Don't say, God, you better or else, because that's when you, that's when you start getting an attitude problem. And that's, you know, I've gone through that myself where I, I've gone a little bit, gone a little bit too far and said, God, do what I want. I don't, I, you know, that's too far. But when you say, God, if it's possible, if, as long as it's not going to hurt something else, as long as it's not going to do something even worse, please take this away from me. Nothing wrong with that. At the same time, if you ask God for that, you need to be willing to turn around and say what Jesus said here. He said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Not my will, your will. And ultimately, that's what matters. If you can come to that conclusion, and that, and that can be the most difficult thing to say, especially when you're going through a horrible loss or going through an, a, a, a terrible tragedy, it can be very difficult to say, God, not my will, but your will. But that's where he tries our faith. That's where we get to see what we're really made of. If you're willing to say that sincerely to him, it can be the greatest relief to your depression. It can be that moment where the light starts shining through. But if you're not willing to say that, that's where bitterness starts creeping in. That's where an unforgiven past starts creeping in. And all kinds of horrible curses and horrible things can grow and, and turn your life even darker. And it, it, I've seen it happen to friends of mine where they have turned on God because they were angry, they, were, they did not appreciate 
what he was doing in their lives because they felt like he was unfair. And look, I mean, was God fair to Jesus? No, he wasn't fair. God never promised that he would be fair to anybody. He promised that he would be just. He promised that he would compensate them, but he never promised to be fair. If God was fair, everybody had the same car, everybody had the same lifestyle, same house, same friends. Now, honestly, things would be really boring if God was fair, okay? But God doesn't work in that way. He doesn't deal in fairnesses. He deals in compensations. And that's very important to understand because Jesus understood that. And that leads me to my next point. One of the greatest motivating factors that we have that the Bible points out in Hebrews. When the Bible talks about why we should, why we should keep going, why, what, what should motivate us to keep pressing on through the hard times? The Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, what it's saying here is, look, when you're going through something, look at what Jesus did. And we read there in the passage what he did. But think about what was the motivation for why he said, not my will, but thine be done. Obviously, there's the love that he had for his father. We know that he loved his father very, very much. And I can go into different passages, but we don't really need to talk about that much. Everybody knows that he loved his father. And obviously, he, we know that he loved us. The Bible says that God commendeth his love for us. And that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. So one of the reasons why he was willing to go to the cross, to go all the way with it, was because of his love for us. But another reason given here in Hebrews chapter 12 is that he did it for the joy that was set before him. No, he didn't want, he didn't want the cup of his father's wrath. He didn't want that shame, that guilt. The condemnation that would fall on him. But he was willing to do it for the joy that was set before him. I know that many people that uh, go through horrible things, I have heard from my own ear, in my own ears many of their testimonies where they say, looking back, even in this life, looking back, I have joy in the trials and tragedies that God has done, that God has allowed in my life. And it takes a lot of faith to do that. But let's not forget the example that he gave. I'm going to turn to one more passage, and I just, I just want to point out one more thing. When it comes to sorrow, when it comes to grief, uh, there's something amazing that God can do with our sorrows, that God can do with our, with our tragedies. We know that when he was at the cross, he was nailed with his hands and his feet. And if you know the story of Thomas, I'm just going to read just a one verse from that passage. But Thomas doubted him. Thomas didn't think that Jesus rose again. He didn't think that he was alive again. He didn't think he was here. But in a moment, he appeared to him. And here's what Jesus said. The Bible says, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And so here's Jesus. And if you understand what had just happened here, it is incredible to realize, when you realize that he still has those, hand, those nail prints in his hands, he still has those nail prints in his feet. And the reason why that's incredible is because he was in his glorified body. The body that he rose again with was his resurrected body. And so even though the Bible says that God wipes away our tears, at, at one point in time, God will wipe away our tears. But the marks, the scars that he went through, through his suffering, through his tragedy, God leaves him there. And I think that one of the reasons why is because they are marks of beauty. They are marks of glory. And when we get to heaven, I really believe that the tragedies, the trials, the sufferings, all the things that we go through for Him, all the things that we come to God and say, Hey, God, not my will, but thine be done. They will become the joy, the victory, the beauty, the glory, the crowns that we get in heaven. Thank you so much for watching. God bless you.